A beginning is the time for taking the most delicate care that the balances are correct. This every sister of the Bene Gesserit knows. To begin your study of the life of Muad'Dib, then take care that you first place him in his time, born in the 57th year of the Padishah Emperor Shaddam IV, and take the most special care that you locate Muad'Dib in his place, the planet Arrakis. Do not be deceived by the fact that he was born on Caladan and lived his first 15 years there. Arrakis, the planet known as Dune, is forever his place. Ten thousand years before the start of Dune, mankind led a crusade, violently expunging all thinking machines from the Imperium. It was called the Butlerian Jihad, and its chief commandment still remains within their OC Bible. Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a human mind. The target of the Jihad was a machine attitude as much as the machines, Leto said. Humans had set those machines up to usurp our sense of beauty, our necessary selfdom, out of which we make living judgments. Naturally, the machines were destroyed. The punishment thereafter for owning or developing artificial intelligence was immediate death. The fall of thinking machines would mean that humankind would have to depend on itself for all its computing needs. And this is where Mintats come into play. Mintats are the human computers of the Imperium. Their mental abilities are ultimately honed to the point where they have become superior to even the ancient thinking machines. Most of the great houses employ a Mintat, for they possess exceptional cognitive abilities of memory and perception that are the foundations for supralogical hypothesizing. Also, Mintat abilities can be greatly increased by the taking of Sappho juice, the substance extracted from the roots found on the planet Echis, but the consumption of this chemical leads to addiction. The Mintat were not the only replacement for thinking machines that developed during the turmoil following the Butlerian Jihad. The Bene Gesserit Sisterhood also came to prominence during this time, as well as the Spacing Guild, whose prescient powers granted by the Spice Melange make safe and instantaneous space travel throughout the universe possible. The Galactic Feudal Empire, which would arise after the Butlerian Jihad, would last for many thousands of years until the rise of the God Emperor. At the start of Dune, the human race has scattered throughout the galaxy and populated many planets, each ruled by aristocratic houses who each owe their loyalty to the Imperial House Carino. Emperor Shadom Carino IV now sits the Imperial Throne. In this time, the Lancerad was the group that represented all the great houses throughout the galaxy. Within the Lancerad, the High Council ruled and was overseen by the Emperor. At the start of Dune, the Emperor has grown to fear House Atreides. The Duke Leto Atreides had become more and more popular within the Lancerad, and it was said that the talent of Leto's own fighting force was beginning to rival the Emperor's own dreaded Imperial Sardaukar soldiers. The Emperor Shaddam Carino IV decided that he must do away with House Atreides. The feud between the Atreides and the Harkonnens had been going on for centuries. The Emperor would use this to his advantage. The planet Arrakis was currently lorded over by the genius and despicable Baron Vladimir Harkonnen. With the help of the Baron, the Emperor created a plan designed to trap and eliminate House Atreides, the fiefdom of the desert planet Arrakis, the source of the Spice Melange, had been given over to the Duke Leto Atreides. But the gift was poisoned, and House Atreides expected as much. The Duke Leto Atreides 
lived the majority of his life on the paradise world of Caladan. In the 20 years prior to the start of Dune, he had ruled over the planet with his concubine, the Bene Gesserit Lady Jessica, by his side. Jessica was the result of the Bene Gesserit breeding program. The sisterhood had intended to breed her with the Duke Leto and produce a daughter who could then breed with a Harkonnen son. This union, they believed, would produce their Kwisatz Haderach. The Lady Jessica was provided with the most advanced Bene Gesserit training available and carried the fate of the sisterhood within her genes. But she betrayed them. Her love for Leto eventually grew so strong that Jessica disobeyed her orders to have only daughters and produced a son, their first child, Paul Atreides. In doing this, Jessica not only disobeyed direct orders from the sisterhood, she betrayed a general understanding held within the sisterhood. The Bene Gesserit are beyond love. Love had nothing to do with it. Reverend Mothers did not act from such mundane motives. Love clouded reason. It diverted the sisters from their duties. Love could be tolerated only where it caused no immediate and obvious disruptions, or where it served the larger purposes of the Bene Gesserit. Otherwise, it was to be avoided. Always, though, it remained an object of disquieting watchfulness. A life without love can be devoted more intensely to the sisterhood. Love, damnable love, weakening love. Love leads to misery. The sisterhood had planned to breed Jessica's daughter with a Harkonnen son, uniting the two houses and producing their long-awaited Kwisatz Haderach. But now they would have to adapt their plans. The son, Paul, was raised on Caladan and trained in the Bene Gesserit way. When the sisterhood realized what Jessica had done, they were furious. But the Bene Gesserit adapt, and the boy was either the Kwisatz Haderach, or he was not. Accompanying House Atreides to Arrakis were several servants and teachers, notably Duncan Idaho, Swordsmaster, Gurney Halleck, Warmaster, Thufir Howitt, Mintat, and Master of Assassins, and Willington Yui, Souk Doctor. The Souk Interschool is devoted to finding cures for the many ailments that afflict mankind. In the Dune universe, they are widely considered to be superior to all other medical groups. Dr. Wellington Yui graduated from the Souk School in 10,112 AG. Through imperial conditioning, the school renders its students incapable of inflicting harm. Once on Arrakis, House Atreides takes up residence at the home previously occupied by House Harkonnen. It is full of traps, and although Mintat Thufir Howitt locates and disarms most of them, a hunter-seeker attacks Paul in his room and nearly kills him. Paul slipped out of bed, headed for the bookcase door that opened into the closet. He stopped at the sound behind him, turned. The carved headboard of the bed was folding down onto the spot where he had been sleeping. Paul froze, and immobility saved his life. From behind the headboard slipped a tiny hunter-seeker, no more than five centimeters long. Paul recognized it at once, a common assassination weapon that every child of royal blood learned about at an early age. It was a ravening sliver of metal, guided by some nearby hand and eye. It could burrow into moving flesh and chew its way up nerve channels to the nearest vital organ. Paul knows that if he calls for help, the device will kill whoever opens the door. He manages to survive the situation by utilizing his unique skill set and ultimately destroying the device. In doing so, Paul also saves the life of Fremen Housekeeper the Shadowout Mapes. As thanks, she gives Paul a valuable piece of information. There is a traitor in their midst, though she cannot say who. Duke Leto is furious over the attempt on his 15-year-old son's life. Paul tells his father of the traitor in their midst, and Leto admits to discussing the possibility several times before with the Traides Mintat Thufir Howitt. 
When speaking with Thufir later, later receives another piece of information. A scrap of a letter bearing the Baron Harkonnen's own seal has been discovered, and it seems to identify the traitor. It says, Ato will never suspect, and when the blow falls on him from a beloved hand, its source alone should be enough to destroy him. The note was under the Baron's own seal, and I've authenticated the seal. Your suspicion is obvious, the Duke said, and his voice was suddenly cold. I'd sooner cut off my arms than hurt you, Howard said. My lord, what if... The Lady Jessica, Leto said, and he felt the anger consuming him. Couldn't you wring the facts out of this party? Unfortunately, Hardy was no longer among the living when we intercepted the courier. The courier, I'm certain, did not know what he carried. I see. Leto shook his head, thinking, what a slimy piece of business. There can't be anything in it. I know my woman. My lord, if... No, the Duke barked. There is a mistake here. That we cannot ignore it, my lord. She's been with me for 16 years. There have been countless opportunities for it. You yourself investigated the school and the woman. Howard spoke bitterly. Things have been known to escape me. It's impossible, I tell you. The Harkonnens want to destroy the Atreides line, meaning Paul too. They've already tried once. Could a woman conspire against her own son? In the days before House Atreides left the planet Caladan for Dune, the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother, Gaius Helen Mohiam, came to visit the Lady Jessica. Jessica had betrayed the sisterhood, used her Bene Gesserit skills to bear a son against their orders, and trained him in the Bene Gesserit way. The sisterhood is furious with Jessica for her transgression, but the boy Paul must be tested with the Gom Jabbar nonetheless. The Gom Jabbar, which is also known as the High-Handed Enemy, is a metacyanide poison needle that sits upon a thimble which is attached to a person's fingertip. The Bene Gesserit make use of the Gom Jabbar when they test the humanity of certain people. The device would be held against the person's neck and used as a deterrent for the person backing out of the test. The test would determine whether an individual's awareness was stronger than their instincts. If their awareness of the Gom Jabbar's presence was strong enough, it would override their instincts to withdraw from the test, which involved great physical pain. One does not obtain food safety freedom by instinct alone. Animal consciousness does not extend beyond the given moment, nor into the idea that its victims may become extinct. An animal destroys and does not produce. Animal pleasures remain close to sensation levels and avoid the perceptual. The human requires a background grid through which to see his universe. Focused consciousness by choice, this forms your grid. Bodily integrity follows nerve blood flow according to the deepest awareness of cell needs. All things, cells, beings, are impermanent. Strive for flow permanence within. The test of the Gom Jabbar was to determine Paul's potential, and also to a certain extent, determine how much of a danger he might be. If he was weak or undisciplined, he could potentially become a danger to the Bene Gesserit breeding plan and would thereafter need to be dealt with, perhaps killed, or subjected to additional training that likely would have resulted in him being taken from Lady Jessica and given into the care of another Bene Gesserit sister. If he however proved strong enough, he would be deemed useful to the breeding plan and allowed to remain under the care of Lady Jessica while they calculated the best potential use for him. The Reverend Mother telling Paul that the test would determine whether or not he was human is in reality an oversimplification of the truth used to justify her actions while also allowing her to maintain Bene Gesserit secrets. The test may on some level test humanity, but the actions of a Bene Gesserit are often layered and possess many implications. 
Paul, in fact, ends up withstanding more pain than any female child before had withstood. Paul passes the test. He is human. The Reverend Mother then tells Paul of the Kwisatz Haderach and of his foretold power, and also of the fact that any man before who has been tested for being the Kwisatz Haderach had died. The Reverend Mother then reveals to Paul and Jessica a terrible prophecy. When you live upon Arrakis, she said, Kala, the land is empty. The moons will be your friends, the sun your enemy. Paul sensed his mother come up beside him, away from her post guarding the door. She had looked at the Reverend Mother and asked, Do you see no hope, your reverence? Not for the father. Helen Mohiam's words seem to suggest that something terrible will befall House Atreides after its arrival on Arrakis, and the Duke will not survive. Leto did not truly believe that Jessica was the traitor. He knew that the letter was merely a ploy by the Baron Harkonnen to wound and confuse House Atreides. Thufir Howitt, however, does not trust Jessica. Jessica discovers Howitt's mistrust of her when a drunken Duncan Idaho stumbles into the Atreides castle and reveals that he too suspects Jessica. The Lady Jessica is shocked and confused by this revelation and attempts to convince Howard that his beliefs are illogical. Jessica tries to explain that it is more logical to believe that it is the Harkonnens that are making him suspicious of her, but Howard will not listen. Jessica decides that the only way to convince Howard that she is innocent is to prove that if she wanted Leto dead, she could have done so long ago. I don't trust your Bene Gesserit motives, he said. You may think you can look through a man. You may think you can make a man do exactly what you... You poor fool, Thufir, she raged. He scowled, pushing himself back in the chair. Whatever rumors you've heard about our schools, she said, the truth is far greater. If I wish to destroy the Duke, or you, or any other person within my reach, you could not stop me. And she thought, why do I let pride drive such words out of me? This is not the way I was trained. This is not how I must shock him. Howard slipped a hand beneath his tunic, where he kept a tiny projector of poison darts. She wears no shield, he thought. Is this a brag she makes? I could slay her now, but ah, uh, the consequences if I am wrong. Jessica saw the gesture towards his pocket, said, let us pray violence shall never be necessary between us. A worthy prayer, he agreed. Meanwhile, the sickness spreads among us, she said. I must ask you again. Isn't it more reasonable to suppose that the Harkonnens have planted this suspicion to pit the two of us against each other? We appear to have returned to stalemate, he said. She sighed, thinking, he's almost ready for it. The Duke and I are father and mother surrogates to our people, she said. The position, he hasn't married you, Howard said. She forced herself to calmness, thinking, a good repost that. But he'll not marry anyone else, she said. Not as long as I live, and we are surrogates, as I've said. To break up this natural order in our affairs, to disturb disrupt and confuse us, which target offers itself most enticingly to the Harkonnens? He sensed the direction she was taking, and his brows drew down in a lowering scowl. The Duke? she asked. Attractive target, yes, but no one, with the possible exception of Paul, is better guarded. Me? I tempt them, surely, but they must know the Bene Gesserit make difficult targets. And there is a better target, one whose duties create necessarily a monstrous blind spot, one to whom suspicion is as natural as breathing, one who builds his entire life on innuendo and mystery. She darted her right hand toward him. You. How it started to leap from his chair. I have not dismissed you through fear. She flared. The old mint had almost fell back into the chair. 
So quickly did his muscles betray him. She smiled without mirth. Now you know something of the real training they give us, she said. Howitt tried to swallow in a dry throat. Her command had been regal, preemptory, uttered in a tone and manner that he found completely irresistible. His body had obeyed her before he could think about it. Nothing could have prevented his response. Not logic, not passionate anger, nothing. To do what she had done spoke of a sensitive, intimate knowledge of the person thus commanded, a depth control he had not dreamed possible. She had used the Bene Gesserit power of voice on him, forcing him to obey her words. This, however, does not go as planned. Instead of Thufir being more confident in the fact that Lady Jessica is not interested in hurting Leto, Thufir is even more disturbed and considers Jessica even more dangerous than he had before. But Jessica was not the traitor. There is a traitor amongst them, but someone that could have never been suspected. All the while House Atreides had been on Arrakis, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen had been plotting their destruction. He indeed planted the ladder to frame Jessica and to move suspicion even further away from the true traitor. The Baron Harkonnen is a monstrosity of a man, a sadistic pedophile and rapist. He is grossly fat and must be held up by suspensers. Despite of all this, the Baron is also a genius and is recognized for his remarkable insight in knowing people. This is demonstrated in the way he has developed the roles of his nephews, the Brutus Glossu Raban, and the Baron's favored Fade Raltha, and also demonstrated in the maintenance of the Baron's own Mintat, the twisted Piter de Vries. The Baron has proven throughout his time as the leader of a major house to be incredibly cruel, and has earned House Harkonnen its reputation. Slavery, murder, and torture on a wide scale find no fault in the Baron's mind. The Harkonnens and the Atreides have been feuding for generations. The Baron now had the chance to destroy the house once and for all, and with the Emperor backing him, he did not know how he could fail, and he knew that the traitor amongst the Atreides would not be detected, because he had recruited the help of a man conditioned against doing harm to eliminate House Atreides. Vladimir Harkonnen had taken the soup doctor Yui's wife, Moana, prisoner, threatening her with torture and even death unless Yui complies with his demands. Dr. Yui would go down as the first instance ever of imperial conditioning being broken. Yui could avoid detection from Jessica's truth-sensing abilities due to the skills he had learned from his wife Moana, who was trained by the Bene Gesserit school as well. Under the cover of night, House Harkonnen launches a devastating attack on House Atreides. Yui disables the protective shields around the Atreides palace, and House Atreides soon falls to the Emperor's own Sardaukar soldiers disguised as Harkonnens. The Emperor does not wish his hand in this to be known. Leto and Jessica and Paul are sedated with drugs. Yui also replaces one of the Duke's teeth with a false one that could emit a poison gas. Yui encourages the Duke to kill the Baron with the poison gas when he is close enough to him. The Duke himself would die as well, but the Baron would be no more. Leto is taken prisoner by the Baron, and Jessica and Paul are taken to the deep desert to die in the sun without still suits or be consumed by the sandworms. Survival on Arrakis is brutal. Water is the most precious thing on the planet rather than spice. Frank Herbert has stated that the scarcity of water on Arrakis is meant to be an analog for the scarcity of oil on Earth. The surface of the planet is almost entirely dry dune deserts, hence the planet's less formal name, Dune. The heat in the desert is sweltering and miserable. Without a still suit to recycle the body's water, one will be dead within hours during the daytime. The Fremen inhabitants of the desert, even with still suits, only travel at night. While in the Ornithopter, a flying vehicle driven by Harkonnen henchmen, Paul and Jessica use their Bene Gesserit skills to get free of their bondage. 
Understanding some of the strange powers possessed by students of the Sisterhood, the Baron insisted that the Lady Jessica be gagged the entire time. He also insisted that one of the three captors be deaf and therefore immune to Jessica's ability of voice. But the fools did not listen to the Baron's words. The deaf man, known as Scarface, was left behind. Paul, for the first time, manages to use the Bene Gesserit power of voice, convincing the men to remove Jessica's gag. And when it is done, the highly skilled Jessica manipulates one man to kill the other and remove Paul's bonds as well. Paul then skillfully crushes the man's heart, killing him instantly. This is the first man Paul has ever killed. Hidden within the Ornithopter, Paul and Jessica discover a bundle containing Leto's ducal ring, still suits, food, and other provisions. Clearly this bundle was left by the Doctor Yui. He is the only one that would have had access to the Thopter and Leto's ring. Yui does this out of some sense of guilt and responsibility for his betrayal of House Atreides. After the assault on House Atreides, Yui finally confronts the Baron demanding to know what has become of his wife, and as Yui has already suspected, the Baron had killed her. But no matter to him, he had already set a deadly trap for the Baron. Dr. Yui was killed then by the Baron's twisted Mintat Piter, and would forever go down in history as a traitor. The Baron then has Duke Leto brought to him. He demands to know where Jessica and Paul have fled, but the Duke truly does not know and would never tell the despicable Baron even if he did. The Baron threatens to torture the Duke, but Leto remembers the secret weapon that Dr. Yui had planted on him. Leto stared across the table, wondering why he waited. The tooth would end it all quickly. Still, it had been good much of his life. He found himself remembering an antenna kite up dangling in the shell blue sky of Caladan and Paul laughing with joy at the sight of it. And he remembered the sunrise here on Arrakis, colored strata of the shield wall, mellowed by dust haze. Too bad, the Baron muttered. He pushed himself back from the table, stood up lightly in his suspensers, and hesitated, seeing a change come over the Duke. He saw the man draw a deep breath, jawline stiffen, the ripple of muscle there as the Duke clamped his mouth shut. How he fears me, the Baron thought. Shocked by the fear that the Baron might escape him, Leto bit sharply on the capsule tooth, felt it break, opened his mouth and expelled the biting vapor. He could taste it as it formed on his tongue. The Baron grew smaller, a figure seen in a tightening tunnel. Leto heard a gasp beside his ear, the silky voiced one, Piter, I got him too. Piter, what's wrong? The rumbling voice was far away. Leto sensed memories rolling in his mind. The old toothless mutterings of hags. The room, the table, the baron. The pair of terrified eyes blue within blue. The eyes, all compressed around him in ruined symmetry. There was a man with a boot toe chin. A toy man falling. The toy man had a broken nose, slanted to the left, an offbeat metronome caught forever at the start of an upward stroke. Leto heard the crash of crockery, so distant, a roaring in his ears, his mind was a bin without end, catching everything, everything that had ever been, every shout, every whisper, every silence. One thought remained to him. Leto saw it in formless light rays of black. The day the flesh shapes, and the flesh the day shapes. The thought struck him with a sense of fullness he knew he could never explain. Silence. The twisted Mintat Piter is killed instantly, and the rest of the men in the room die as well, including the noble Duke Leto. But the Baron manages to escape in the nick of time and preserves his own life. Now, lost in the desert, Paul and Jessica must find a way to survive. It is during this time, however, that Paul's powers truly begin to awaken. 
Paul sensed the hyper-alertness of his mind, reading her reactions, computing on minutia. You see it now, he said. Satellites watch the terrain below. There are things in the deep desert that will not bear frequent inspection. You're suggesting that the guild itself controls this planet? She was so slow. No, he said. The Fremen. They are paying the guild for privacy. Paying in a coin that is freely available to anyone with desert power. Spice. This is more than a second approximation, answer. This is the straight line computation. Depend on it. Paul, Jessica said. You're not a Mintat yet. You can't know for sure how. I'll never be a Mintat, he said. I am something else. A freak. Paul, how can you say such? Leave me alone. As Paul's abilities heighten, more and more becomes clear to him. For one, the Fremen hold much more power than initially believed. The Fremen people, who exist in greater numbers than anyone had ever expected, are the secret power on Arrakis. They are overlooked by most members of the Imperium and are considered to be primitive savages. Frank Herbert based several parts of their society and culture off of real-life Arabic traditions. The Fremen had come to the planet Arrakis thousands of years ago. Over the centuries that they have been on Dune, only the fittest have survived. Their culture has adapted a way of life to survive and even thrive in the harsh conditions of the planet. The Fremen are also known to be amazing fighters. Fremen society is organized into communities of people called Sieches. Leading each Sietch is a Niab, the Arabic word meaning deputy or representative of authority, who ascends to leadership upon defeating his predecessor in combat, proving himself to be the strongest member of the tribe. A notable characteristic of the Fremen is their blue in blue eyes, the result of spice addiction. The spice is everywhere on Arrakis. All Fremen develop blue in blue eyes well before they reach adulthood. Now, in the desert plains of Arrakis, exposed to more spice than ever before, Paul's awareness expands dramatically. His vision is clearer than anyone before him. If you are not the Kwisatz Haderach, Jessica said. What? You couldn't possibly know, he said. You won't believe it until you see it. And he thought, I'm a seed. He suddenly saw how fertile was the ground into which he had fallen. And with this realization, the terrible purpose filled him, creeping through the empty space within, threatening to choke him with grief. He had seen two main branchings along the way ahead. In one, he confronted an old evil baron and said, Hello, grandfather. The thought of that path and what lay along it sickened him. The other path held long patches of gray obscurity except for peaks of violence. He had seen a warrior religion there a fire spreading across the universe, with the Atreides green and black banner waving at the head of fanatic legions drunk on spice liquor. Gurney Halleck and a few other of his father's men, a pitiful few were among them, all marked by the hawk symbol from the shrine of his father's skull. I can't go that way, he muttered. That's what the old witches of your school really want. I don't understand you, Paul, his mother said. He remained silent, thinking like the seed he was, thinking with the race consciousness he had first experienced as terrible purpose. He found that he no longer could hate the Bene Gesserit, or the Emperor, or even the Harkonnens. They were all caught up in the need of their race to renew its scattered inheritance, to cross and mingle and infuse their bloodlines in a great new pooling of genes, and the race knew only one sure way for this, the ancient way, the tried and certain way that rolled over everything in its path, Jihad. Surely I cannot choose that way, he thought, but he saw again in his mind's eye the shrine of his father's skull, 
and the violence with the green and black banner waving in its midst. Jessica cleared her throat, worried by his silence. Then, the Fremen will give us sanctuary? He looked up, staring across the green lighted tent at the inbred, patrician inlines of her face. Yes, he said. That's one of the ways. He nodded. Yes, they'll call me Muad'Dib, the one who points the way. Yes, that's what they'll call me. And he closed his eyes thinking, now my father, I can mourn you. And he felt the tears coursing down his cheeks. Book one of the first novel ends here, with the revelations that the Baron Harkonnen is actually the maternal grandfather of Paul, the Lady Jessica's own father, though this information is not known to her or the Baron, and also that they will find sanctuary amongst the desert people, the Fremen. Paul also senses a terrible purpose, a great jihad of violence that will spread, a religious war in his name. After managing to survive in the desert for a while on their own, Paul and Jessica eventually do encounter the Fremen. The naive of this tribe, Stilgar, after viewing the fighting prowess of Jessica, her weirding way, the special martial arts of the Bene Gesserit, he agrees to allow Jessica and Paul to enter the tribe under the condition that they will teach them the weirding way. Jessica must play a very delicate game, using her knowledge of the Sisterhood's Missionara Protectiva she will manipulate the Fremen people in order to preserve House Atreides. The superstitions maintained by the Fremen detailed the coming of a prescient son of a Bene Gesserit who would lead them to freedom. This figure is referred to as the Lisan al Gayib in Fremen myth, and this is the son that will become the Mahdi, the Arabic word meaning the guided one, of the Fremen, and lead them to freedom. Long have the Fremen people been spat upon and oppressed by the Imperium, and a myth such as this was highly appealing to them. Thus, from the moment Paul and Jessica arrived on Arrakis, the Fremen had believed that their prophecies were being fulfilled. The fact that the Mahdi legend specifically had been planted on Doom indicates to Jessica that conditions on Doom are truly horrible. The Mahdi legend, she knew, was reserved for only the harshest environments, where a Bene Gesserit would need the maximum advantage over surrounding influences. Over the course of the next two years, Paul would amass more and more power, respect, and influence amongst the Fremen people. He has established himself as a prophet, a powerful religious leader to the Fremen. His skills in combat are now legendary amongst the Fremen for he has trained a squad of death commandos called the Feda King, the most loyal and deadly soldiers on all of Arrakis. At this point, the Emperor Shaddam, along with the Baron Harkonnen and the rest of the Imperium, assume that Paul and Jessica are dead. During this time, Paul has taken the Fremen woman Chani, daughter of Leit Kynes, as concubine. They have a son together, named Leto for Paul's father. Jessica has become Sayadina of the Fremen, a rogue reverend mother. Due to the Missionara Protectiva, many fringe cultures such as the Fremen have produced so-called wild reverend mothers, who possess many of the skills of the Bene Gesserit reverend mothers, but without official training. Jessica encounters one of them during the Spice Agony. She absorbs the dying reverend mother's consciousness and unblocks her own genetic memory by converting the deadly truth-sayer drug, the Water of Life. But the cost was greater than she understood. Jessica, since before the Harkonnen attack, had been carrying the daughter of Duke Leto Atreides, Aaliyah, and when Jessica underwent the spice agony, unblocking her genetic memory, Aaliyah's genetic memory, is unlocked as well, and in that instant, she becomes a reverend mother too. Aaliyah is her mother, and her grandmother, and her grandfather. The full maternal genetic bloodline 
in one mind. The Bene Gesserit consider a child such as this to be abomination. You should have told us you were pregnant. Jessica found the voice that talked within the mutual awareness. Why? This changes both of you. Holy Mother, what have we done? Jessica sensed a forced shift in the mutual awareness, saw another moat presence within the inward eye. The other moat darted wildly here, there, circling. It radiated pure terror. You'll have to be strong, the old Reverend Mother's image presence said. Be thankful it is a daughter you carry. This would have killed a male fetus. Aaliyah, you see, was pre-born. The shock and trauma that this brought onto the unborn child was catastrophic. What happens when a person does not have the time to establish their own personality? The weight of the egos stretching back through the genetic history becomes unbearable. Eventually the ego memories of the person's ancestors could assert themselves and eventually govern the person's behavior. Possession. Aaliyah's strangeness is frightening to the Fremen. She is a child, but not a child. They do not understand her. There is yet misunderstanding because of Aaliyah's strangeness. The women are fearful because a child little more than an infant talks of things that only adults should know. They do not understand the change in the womb that made Aaliyah different. Paul's concern that he will be the instigator of a jihad or holy war led by the Fremen under his banner is perhaps one of the most important motifs in Dune. He worries that the religious war will spread across the galaxy as House Atreides and the Fremen kill everyone in their path. Paul thinks that the reason for this religious war is that it will invigorate the human gene pool which has been stagnant during the last 10,000 years since the Butlerian Jihad. Paul deeply desires to free himself from these possible futures. He spends the rest of the book considering his options in every situation, attempting to predict each outcome and trying to take the course that will prevent such bloody violence. The Jihad is the embodiment of Paul's sense of terrible purpose, a cursed fate that he feels he must resist. During the time with the Fremen, Paul encounters the now dead Liet Kynes, Imperial Planetologist, who was in all but name one of the Fremen. Paul learns of the Fremen plans to terraform the planet Dune into an Eden full of life, guided by Kynes. After Kynes is murdered by the Harkonnens, it is Paul who begins to replace him as the spiritual and military leader of the Fremen. The final test in Paul becoming a Fremen is for him to mount a sandworm. The worm riding ritual is a coming of age ritual among the Fremen people, and in that moment his vision is blocked. He has not seen this moment in his prescience, and therefore he does not know the outcome. It came from the southeast, a distant hissing, a sand whisper. Presently, he saw the faraway outline of the creature's track against the dawn light and realized he had never before seen a maker this large, never heard of one this size. It appeared to be more than half a league long and the rise of the sand wave at its cresting head was like the approach of a mountain. This is nothing I have seen by vision or in life, Paul cautioned himself. He hurried across the path of the thing to take his stand, caught up entirely by the rushing needs of the moment. Paul, of course, survives this test and mounts his first worm, but the young men of the tribe are not content. They clearly see Paul as the strongest member of the tribe and wonder why he has not called out Stilgar yet, who has grown close to Paul. The idea of replacement or recycling is important to the Fremen. Water is scarce on Arrakis, so the Fremen use the water from the dead corpses 
to replenish their wells. Even in light of this, Paul has no wish to kill Stilgar. Later, the Fremen discover a spice smuggling operation taking place in their territory. Paul realizes that the operation is being led by none other than Gurney Halleck, former master of arms to House Atreides. He survived the Harkonnen raid. Paul reveals himself to Gurney, who confirms to Paul that he is still his duke and he remains loyal to him. After leading Gurney and his smuggler men into a Fremen cavern, several of the so-called smugglers reveal themselves to be Sardaukar soldiers in disguise. They attack, but the Fremen kill all but a few of them. Paul allow a few to escape so that they can report back to House Harkonnen of the fighting power of the Fremen. The Baron Harkonnen, in the time since the raid on House Atreides, has regained the fiefdom of Arrakis. He has manipulated aging Mintat Thufir Howard into serving him. The Baron, who resides on Gidi Prime, has placed his cruel nephew, the Beast Raban, in charge of the people on the planet Dune. Fade Ratha, who the Baron intends to precede him, has grown impatient and wants the Baron dead. In one instance, while raping a slave boy, the Baron is almost killed by a poison needle that was implanted into the boy's thigh. The Baron knows that Fade is to blame. He quickly realizes who Fade's spies are within his guard. He orders them to be killed immediately. The Baron confronts Fade Rautha and chastises him for the attempt on his life. He tells the teenager that one day, not too far in the future, he will step down and allow Fade Rautha to succeed him. The Baron also assigns Thufir to watch over Fade from this point on. For now, Fade decides not to make another attempt on the Baron's life. Eventually, the Fremen attempt to force Paul to call out Stilgar, but he refuses. Instead, Paul accepts his role as Muad'Dib, the prophetic leader. He uses this role to differentiate himself from Stilgar's more secular position. The Fremen accept this, and also accept Paul's other role as Duke of Arrakis. Paul has also learned that the Baron Harkonnen has cut off Raban in supplies and reinforcements. It will then be easier for the Fremen people to take control of Arrakis from the Harkonnens, and they are ready to fight. They are willing to die for their liberation. Gurney Halleck, upon seeing the Lady Jessica, quickly attacks her, still under the belief that she was the traitor to House Atreides. He threatens to kill her while he holds a knife to her throat. Paul, however, convinces Gurney that Jessica was not the traitor, but that it was instead the Dr. Yui who betrayed House Atreides. Gurney becomes overwhelmed with shame and asks to be killed, but Paul refuses. In Earth's history, messianic figures are typically passive. Jesus, for example, though much violence has occurred in his name since his death. But works of sci-fi and fantasy are different. In them, the Savior, or the One, will often lead his people to triumph by violent means. Aragorn, Daenerys Targaryen. Paul is destined to fill the most common role in fantasy and science fiction. The Savior, who will lead his adopted people to victory over their enemies by using violence, and Paul remains aware of the significance of his power and the Jihad that may be a consequence of that power. But Paul was not the Kwisatz Haderach yet. He had realized something during Gurney's attempt on his mother's life. He had not foreseen it in any vision. His body had slowly acquired a certain spice tolerance that made prescient visions fewer and fewer dimmer and dimmer. The solution appeared obvious to him. I will drown the Maker. We will see now whether I am the Kwisatz Haderach who can survive the test that the Reverend Mothers have survived. Paul decides to take the deadly Watcher of Life, the Truthsayer drug which no male has ever survived. And it came to pass, 
in the third year of the desert war that Paul Muad'Dib lay alone in the cave of birds beneath the Kiswa hangings of an inner cell, and he lay as one dead, caught up in the revelation of the water of life his being translated beyond the boundaries of time by the poison that gives life. Thus was the prophecy made that the Lisan al-Gayib might be both dead and alive. After three weeks in a coma, Paul emerges as the Kwisatz Haderach. He looks into space and sees that the Emperor and the Harkonnens have amassed a huge armada to invade the planet to regain the control that Raban has lost. Some time later, the Siach where Aaliyah and Leto II reside is attacked and the Sardaukar soldiers kill Leto and take Aaliyah prisoner. Aaliyah is then brought to the capital city of Arrakis, Arakin, by the Emperor Shaddam himself. It is here that the story comes to its climax. My dear Baron, the Emperor said, become acquainted with the sister of Mu'adib. The sister? The Baron shifted his attention to the Emperor. I do not understand. I too sometimes err on the side of caution, the Emperor said. It has been reported to me that your uninhabited South Polar regions exhibit evidence of human activity. But that's impossible, the Baron protested. The worms, there's sand clear to the... These people seem to be able to avoid the worms, the Emperor said. The child sat down on the dais beside the throne, dangled her feet over the edge, kicking them. There was such an air of sureness in the way she appraised her surroundings. The Baron stared at the kicking feet, the way they moved the black robe the wink of sandals beneath the fabric. Unfortunately, the Emperor said, I only sent in five troop carriers with a light attack force to pick up prisoners for questioning. We barely got away with three prisoners and one carrier. Mind you, Baron, my Sardaukar were almost overwhelmed by a force composed mostly of women, children, and old men. This child here was in command of one of the attacking groups. You see, your majesty, the baron said. You see how they are. I allowed myself to be captured, the child said. I did not want to face my brother and have to tell him that his son had been killed. Only a handful of our men got away, the emperor said. Got away. You hear that? We'd had them too, the child said, except for the flames. My Sardaukar used the attitudinal jets on their carriers as flamethrowers, the Emperor said, a move of desperation, and the only thing that got them away with their three prisoners. Mark that, my dear Baron. Sardaukar forced to retreat in confusion from women and children and old men. We must attack them in force, the Baron rasped. We must destroy every last vestige of silence, the Emperor roared. He pushed himself forward on his throne. Do not abuse my intelligence any longer. You stand there in your foolish innocence and... Majesty, the truthsayer said. He waved her to silence. You say you don't know about the activity we found, nor the fighting qualities of these superb people. The emperor lifted himself half off his throne. What do you take me for, Baron? The Baron took two backward steps, thinking it was Raban. He has done this to me. Raban has. And this fake dispute with Duke Leto, the Emperor purred, sinking back into his throne. How beautifully you maneuvered it. Majesty, the Baron pleaded. What are you? Silence. The old Bene Gesserit put a hand on the Emperor's shoulder, leaned close to whisper in his ear. The child seated on the dais stopped kicking her feet and said, Make him afraid some more, Shaddam. I shouldn't enjoy this, but I find the pleasure impossible to suppress. Quiet child, the Emperor said. He leaned forward, put a hand on her head, stared at the Baron. Is it possible, Baron? Could you be as simple-minded as my truth-sayer suggest? Do you not recognize this child, daughter of your ally, Duke Leto? My father was never his ally, the child said. 
My father is dead, and this old Harkonnen beast has never seen me before. The Baron was reduced to stupefied glaring. When he found his voice, it was only to rasp. Who? I am Alia, daughter of the Duke Leto and the Lady Jessica, sister of Duke Paul Muad'Dib, the child said. She pushed herself off the dais, dropped to the floor of the audience chamber. My brother has promised to have your head atop this battle standard, and I think he shall. Be hushed, child, the Emperor said, and he sank back into his throne, hand to chin, studying the Baron. I do not take the Emperor's orders, Aaliyah said. She turned, looked up at the old Reverend Mother. She knows. The Emperor glanced up at his truth-sayer. What does she mean? This child is an abomination. You babble, old woman, Aaliyah said. You don't know how it was, yet you rattle on like a purblind fool. Aaliyah closed her eyes, took a deep breath, and held it. The old Reverend Mother groaned and staggered. Aaliyah opened her eyes. That is how it was, she said. A cosmic accident, and you played your part in it. The Reverend Mother held out both hands. Palms pushed the air toward Aaliyah. What is happening here? The Emperor demanded. Child, can you truly project your thoughts into the mind of another? That is not how it is at all, Aaliyah said. Unless I am born as you, I cannot think as you. Kill her, the old woman muttered and clutched the back of the throne for support. Kill her. The sunken old eyes glared at Aaliyah. Silence, the emperor said, and he studied Aaliyah. Child, can you communicate with your brother? My brother knows I'm here, Aaliyah said. Can you tell him to surrender as the price of your life? Aaliyah smiled up at him with clear innocence. I shall not do that, she said. The Baron stumbled forward to stand beside Aaliyah. Majesty, he pleaded, I knew nothing of. Interrupt me once more, Baron, the Emperor said, and you will lose the powers of interruption forever. He kept his attention focused on Aaliyah, studying her through slitted lids. You will not, eh? Can you read my mind, what I'll do if you disobey me? I've already said I cannot read minds, she said, but one does not need telepathy to read your intentions. The Emperor scowled. Child, your cause is hopeless. I have but to rally my forces and reduce this planet to... It is not that simple, Aaliyah said. She looked at the two guildsmen, Ask them. It's not wise to go against my desires, the Emperor said. You should not deny me the least thing. My brother comes now, Aaliyah said. Even an Emperor may tremble before Muad'Dib, for he has the strength of righteousness and heaven smiles upon him. The Emperor surged to his feet. This play has gone far enough. I will take your brother and this planet and grind them too. The room crumbled and shook around them. There came a sudden cascade of sand behind the throne where the hutment was coupled to the Emperor's ship. The abrupt flickering tightening of skin pressure told of a wide area shield being activated. I told you, Aaliyah said, my brother comes. It is at this moment, under cover of a giant sandstorm, Paul and his army of Fremen warriors attack the capital city riding on the backs of dozens of giant sandworms. They destroy the shield wall. In the chaos, Aaliyah kills the Baron Harkonnen and escapes the Emperor. I'm sorry, Grandfather, Aaliyah said. You've met the Atreides Gum Jabbar. She got to her feet, dropped a dark needle from her hand. Unlike Duke Leto Atreides, the Baron Harkonnen never saw the potential of the Fremen. He viewed them as savages, and that was the death of him. Aaliyah then goes to seek out and slit the throats of any wound in Harkonnen and Sardaukar soldiers, as Fremen tradition dictates. Upon witnessing the coming onslaught, the Emperor Shaddam and the Reverend Mother Gaius realize that they have but one weapon left to them, treachery.
The Fremen quickly defeat the Emperor Sardaukar, and Paul takes his place at the Arakeen Governor's Mansion, which was the home of House Atreides when they first arrived on the planet Dune. Paul has one of the captive Sardaukar soldiers relay a message to Shaddam. Paul wishes to discuss the Emperor's surrender. At this point, however, Paul can still see the Jihad, which worries him. The Emperor and his entourage arrive at the mansion. The Emperor has instructed Thuthir to kill Paul using a poison needle, but Thuthir refuses. He dies in Paul's arms due to a poison that the Baron had administered to him in secret. The Emperor then threatens to order the ships of the Lancerad, who hovered above the planet, to attack the Fremen. But Paul orders the Spacing Guild to force the Lancerad ships to leave. The Guild obeys he who controls the spice, and that was now Paul Atreides. The Emperor was powerless. Paul sees the Reverend Mother as well. Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohaim, Paul said. It has been a long time since Caladan, hasn't it? She looked past him at his mother, said, Well, Jessica, I see that your son is indeed the one. For that you can be forgiven even the abomination of your daughter. Paul stilled a cold and piercing anger and said, You have never had the right or cause to forgive my mother anything. The old woman locked eyes with him. Try your tricks on me, old witch, Paul said. Where is your gum, Jabbar? Try looking into that place where you dare not look. You'll find me there staring out at you. The old woman dropped her gaze. Have you nothing to say? Paul demanded. I welcome you to the ranks of humans, she muttered. Don't besmirch that. Paul raised his voice. Observe her, comrades. This, a Bene Gesserit reverend mother, patient in a patient cause. She could wait with her sisters, ninety generations for the proper combination of genes and environment to produce the one person their schemes required. Observe her. She knows that the ninety generations have produced that person. Here I stand, but I will never do her bidding. Jessica, the old woman screamed, silence him. Silence him yourself, Jessica said. Paul glared at the old woman. For your part in this, I could gladly have you strangled, he said. You couldn't prevent it, he snapped as she stiffened in rage. But I think it better punishment that you live out your years, never able to touch me or bend me to a single thing your scheming desires. Jessica, what have you done? The old woman demanded. I'll give you only one thing, Paul said. You saw part of what the race needs, but how poorly you saw it. You think to control breeding and intermix a select few according to your master plan. How little you understand of what. You mustn't speak of these things. The old woman hissed. Silence! Paul roared. The word seemed to take substance as it twisted through the air between them under Paul's control. The old woman reeled back into the arms of those behind her, face blank with shock at the power with which he had seized her psyche. Jessica, she whispered. Jessica. I remember your gum, Jabbar, Paul said. You remember mine. I can kill you with a word. The Fremen around the ball glanced knowingly at each other. Did the legend not say? And his word shall carry death eternal to those who stand against righteousness. It is here that Fade Ratha Harkonnen comes forth. If Paul had been born a girl, as the sisterhood intended, he would have likely married Fade Ratha. But instead, they cannot coexist. Fade challenges Paul to a duel. Fade cheats, but still falls to Paul Muad'Dib nonetheless. The Emperor's last hope is that Finring, also a product of the Bene Gesserit breeding plan, who was almost a Kwisatz Haderach himself, would slay Paul. But Finring refuses, feeling a special connection with Paul. The Emperor is out of options. Paul ascends the throne and is allowed to marry the Emperor's daughter, the Princess Irulan. 
he ensures Chani that the marriage is strictly political and that he will remain loyal to her. Book 1 in the Doom Saga ends here, with Paul's ascension to Emperor of the Imperium. As Paul does not know how he intends to avert the religious jihad, we also do not know how he plans to bring peace. The novel presents only one allusion to Paul's future plans. They sense that I must take the throne, but they cannot know I do it to prevent the jihad. As Emperor of the Imperium, Paul would be the most powerful person in the universe. Paul hopes to use this power to prevent the deaths of millions of people. Each chapter header in Dune includes a quote by the Princess Irulan, many about Paul. By the end, we do not know whether these quotations are in praise of a great religious leader who brought a time of peace, or in praise of a person who brought a deadly war. We still do not know whether the Fremen will become soldiers of war or guardians of peace. The ending is left ambiguous. The action in Dune reaches its peak toward the final pages, and the novel ends suddenly and anticlimactically. Many avenues remain unexplored. Paul rising to ruler of the Imperium, and the Fremen regaining control of Arrakis is a complete reversal of the status from the novel's opening. At the beginning of Dune, Shadom and the Baron dominated the Atreides and the Fremen. The power structure of Arrakis has changed since Paul was on Caladan. Paul is not only now Duke of Arrakis, but he is also the new Emperor of the Universe. The Fremen will soon turn their planet into the Garden Paradise that Kine spoke of, and they have long desired. Once this change occurs, however, we wonder how the Fremen's culture will change because of it. Dune is possibly the most influential sci-fi novel of all time. It combines sci-fi and fantasy with the multi-layered interactions of important social issues concerning human social interaction, religion, and genetic development. Dune is widely considered to be far ahead of its time in pointing out the importance of preserving the ecology of a planet, the conservation of resources, and by addressing the complexities of religion, Dune explored a topic that surprisingly was rarely addressed in science fiction prior. Dune's portrayal of the downfall of the Galactic Empire has been compared to Edward Gibbon's Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Lorenzo di Tommaso outlines similarities between the two works, highlighting the excesses of Emperor Shaddam and the Baron Harkonnen. The Emperor loses his effectiveness as a ruler from excess of ceremony and pompousness. Di Tommaso points out that the Baron is similarly materially indulgent, corrupt, and sexually decadent. Gibbon's decline and fall blames the fall of Rome on the rise of Christianity. Complacency weakened the soldiers of Rome and left it open to attack. Similarly, the Emperor's Sardaukar fighters are no match for the Fremen of Arrakis. Because of their own overconfidence, and the Fremen's capacity for self-sacrifice. The Fremen put the community before themselves in every instance, while the world outside wallows in luxury at the expense of others. Dune has before been criticized for presenting a sexist portrayal of women. This couldn't be further from the truth. Paul's approach to power required his upbringing under the female-oriented Bene Gesserit. Without his mother's training, he would have never become the Kwisatz Haderach. Though the Sisterhood claims that they only exist to serve, they secretly operate as a long-dominating shadow government behind all of the great houses and their marriages or divisions. The Dune universe only appears to be patriarchal at first glance. Throughout the novel, as Paul becomes more and more powerful, more alien to the reader, Jessica remains human mentoring Paul at crucial moments. Frank Herbert did six years of research before he began writing Dune. He spent a year and a half writing the first novel. He conceived of a long novel 
What became a trilogy was initially one book about the messianic convulsions that periodically overtake mankind. Demagogues, fanatics, con game artists, the innocent and the not so innocent bystanders, all were to have a part in this drama. This grows from my theory that superheroes are disastrous for humankind. Even if we find a real hero, whatever or whoever that may be, eventually fallible mortals take over the power structure that always comes into being around such a leader. Frank Herbert, Doom Genesis. Frank Herbert understood that during difficult times, people become perfectly willing to give over their agency, all decision-making capacity, to any leader who can quote wrap himself in the myth fabric of society. Hitler, Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, and Stalin are among the examples Frank Herbert names. Frank Herbert points out that although these figures often have larger-than-life appearances, each possesses human faults. This is a major theme of the Dune Saga. Never give your critical faculties away to people in power, regardless of how admirable these people may seem to be. The novel Dune understands that power attracts the corruptible, people who want power for the sake of it. Frank Herbert suggests that a certain proportion of such people are imbalanced, or perhaps even insane. Frank Herbert believed that humanity must continue to evolve or it would die. I now believe that evolution or de-evolution never ends short of death that no society has ever achieved an absolute pinnacle, that all humans are not created equal. In fact, I believe attempts to create some abstract equalization create a morass of injustices that rebound on the equalizers. Equal justice and equal opportunity are ideals we should seek, but we should recognize that humans administer the ideals and that humans do not have equal ability. This quote may be off-putting to some, but all it is saying is that yes, some humans are smarter than others, some have greater physical prowess. Regardless of this, we should embrace these differences while still providing equal justice and protection under the law, and not pretend that all humans are the same. In the next part of this series, we will explore the second novel in Frank Herbert's original Doom series, Doom Messiah, which details the consequences of Paul's ascension to ruler of the universe. For more Doom, check out the videos in the Doom playlist on my channel.